I'm Kelly Siegel, and this is Harder Than Life, a podcast about self-love, self-awareness, business, and health. We tell outrageous stories and boil everything down to simple, practical advice you can start using today. Let's get living. All right, this is the Harder Than Life podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Siegel. We are going to deviate today and simply have a real talk conversation with my new friend, Jim Hernandez. His story of addiction led him to homelessness for 18 months, had his car repossessed, and that isn't even the worst of it, but... I'm going to let him tell you the harder than life crusade to peace, freedom, and happiness, though, you, through, you guessed it, vulnerability. Welcome, welcome, my California brother. Isn't it early there hey, right now? God. Isn't it early? What's it's, that? it's super early there right now, right? Yeah, man. I almost, I almost sent you a text last night asking if we could redo this. <laughs> Bro, thank you so much. It's, it's with the schedules for these things. Who knew that I would actually, people would want to hear me, so... Uh, it, the schedule's busy. We don't get you in. It's it's gonna be a while. And and but man, man, it's I booked so- this like over a month ago. I, I see that you're a wanted man. <laughs> you're in demand. Well, it's gotta be um, nice. It's um it's humbling, man. It's really humbling. It's it, it you don't understand. You do understand. Actually, what we're talking about. You understand the violence it took to to get to where we are today, and that's what we're gonna talk about. So, Jim, tell me what's your story and what, you, what why does it matter. Well, man, just to, just to, like in a nutshell, you know, um, my my story is my story. It is what it is. Like, you know, so many people that are going to listen to this and their addiction recovery can relate. You know, what it comes down to is I got help from unexpected places when I was at a very, very bottom of my life. I uh, was able to get help and, and recreate myself. And now um, I feel like my karmic debt to society and just kind of uh, God's path for me is to try to try to help as many other people and be that unexpected place for other people now. Um, so, you know, we don't need to get into, uh, we don't need to get in all the war stories right now. You know, I read your book. I've been diving into your book and a lot of, uh, a lot of childhood trauma played, played a, a big part, but we can only use that card so much as adults. Once we, once we realize it and we start growing from it, you can only pull that card out so many times. And then we just got to get past it because, you know, we can't be, a, we can't continue being a victim of our past. Well, we get past it, but we have to share so people can resonate and understand who you are. I mean, we're we're just we're neophytes in the business, just get up and coming. So people want to know hey, who is Jim Hernandez? What what? Why is he on the Heart of the Life podcast today? So it isn't. Uh, we're not trying to play a victim. We're just trying to share our story because other people are probably not as far along as you are, and they're going to be like, "Oh, so wait a minute, tell me about what he what decision? What what did you call it? A, a harm or toxic?" behavior to lose your to be homeless for 18 months so just just give us the, the ten thousand feet overview uh doesn't have to be in detail just so the, the, the people understand why you're here today yeah oh yeah okay um you know um a lot of being uncomfortable in my own skin a lot of um uh isolation childhood trauma you know i was raised by i was raised by a young mom my, my, my mom had me when she was 16 she was a child trying to raise a child, you know, back in the early, early 80s. Times were much different back then. No social media, no internet, stuff like that. You know, back when we had phones on a wall and all that good stuff. So, um, you know, my mom uh, trying to do her best work in three jobs and, and wanting to um, have a man in her life for herself and as much for me. I know she wanted to, to she knew I wanted that male role model, that male figure to, to do things with. I was... My dad was never really part of the picture. And when he was, it was a lot of chaos and toxicity. But uh, my mom would allow men to move in really easy with her really quickly. And, um, and you know, a lot of, uh, you know, these men doing things to me that, that uh, I'm sure you, we can figure out. Childhood trauma, you know, uh, molestation, stuff like that at a very young age. And then, uh, you know, when you realize, when you get to the age where you realize, like, oh, shit, that stuff that happened was, that was some, that was wrong. You know, then I had, uh, I didn't know how to deal with it and I blamed myself. And so then I bottled that up. And a lot of being uncomfortable. My last name is Hernandez. Uh, I never speak Spanish. When I did go um, over to my dad's side of the family, who was all from Mexico, they didn't speak English. So it's like I didn't fit in over there. Um, my dad was, was uh, one of us. He was an alcoholic and still is. Uh, a lot of violence, a lot of uh, anger in that man. And um, a lot of abuse, mental and physical abuse as a child. Um, and then, uh, just when I found alcohol, 
you know, um, from being from a place where I never really fit in, I always struggled. I was uh, in school. I was I was good at sports. I could throw a football far and I could hit a baseball far. And uh, I was captain of the football team and um, ASB president. And I was expected to. I felt like I was expected to always be something I never was inside. And when I got alcohol for that first time, man, I just felt like oof, here was a solution to all my problems. Like, where has this been all my life? And so um, addiction really kicked in in my early, my late teens and barely early 20s. Um, but my childhood trauma was was still there and, and subconsciously and consciously affected like every relationship I ever had, whether it's a friendship, a relationship with a female. And, you know, long story short, it just uh, addiction took everything from me. Um, my homes, my cars uh, led me to be homeless on the streets in LA for about 18 months. I remember, I remember right before, right when I lost my last job, I went on Groupon. Now, if you remember Groupon, that app's still around. And I bought yes. a membership to to Gold's Gym in Venice, and uh, bought a year membership because I knew I was gonna, I knew I was about to get kicked out of my apartment. And I was like, where am I going to shower? And so uh, I bought a mem- year membership to Gold's Gym in Venice Beach, the the mecca. Um, and I bought a, a little tiny closet shaped sized uh, storage unit. And so I put what I could in there and I lived out of my car until my car got repossessed. I remember I walked out of the gym one day and my car wasn't in the parking lot anymore. And I was like, okay, all right, uh, here we go. So then I'm just on the streets in, in Los Angeles. And that lasted about another, um, from when my car got repossessed until I got into treatment about another year. So I was living on the streets and. Uh, and uh, in and out of jail, 5150, I don't know, three times I've been, I've been in jail and, and, and uh, at least 18 times in my life. And uh, <laughs> that was another identity crisis, uncomfortable with my own skin because I'm Mexican, but uh, I've never been in gangs. I don't have any tattoos. And so inside, I didn't run with the Mexicans. I ran with what they call the woods, which is the white people. And uh, that caused a lot of problems inside um, being Hispanic, the last name Hernandez, but running with the whites. So. Um, you know, just more chaos. And so um, about uh, a year after my car got repossessed, I, I, I um, got help from a place called Homeless Healthcare of LA. They got me into a, a government funded treatment center, which is uh, a, a rehab with 53 other dudes. It was pretty much LA County Jail West because it was all guys that were coming out of prison or off the streets and uh, wasn't much recovery going there, but uh, you could get it if you wanted it. And I decided for the first time in my life to ditch my pride and my ego and uh, and surrender. And I, I was fully willing. And so uh, that changed the trajectory of the whole rest of my life. And uh, when was that? When, what, when was that? What it year was, was that? Where was it? Is that we said? That was in Venice Beach. No, when? So that was 2016. So my sober date's February 19th, 2019. So you know, when I got into treatment, uh, I got to the first time I got to about 11 months and, uh, and then I went through a little relapse, but 2016 is when I actually got off the streets. So Jim, I want to say something. Um, first of all, I love you and you matter and you're now safe. And that all just resonated with me tremendously. Obviously as you just read my books, you know, that I've been through all that. And I, I, you know, alcohol for me, got me away from all those demons, all those childhood demons, and I could be who I, who I am. And, but the collateral damage that came with it. So I'm going to say a couple things, and I hope they don't trigger you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tread very lightly because I want the listeners to understand what, what I just heard. So as a child, you thought this was all your fault, and you ended up drinking the poison and expecting your, your dad or your mother to, to suffer. And all you did is keep punishing yourself so if this is what you're doing look at us harder than life and jim here or, uh, jim here so we know that um it's just not the way it's not the path and um yeah I, I just my heart feels for you man and I'm, I'm so glad that you're here today with your sober af shirt and you're early in the morning at the gym and <laughs> you know and that's really what i want to talk about is what why did you decide to get clean and what was your why You know, um, that aha moment, like, I honestly, why did I decide to get clean? I had no other option, to be honest. Like, you know, I was living on the streets, and and they say, uh, you know, when you're, sometimes you're all dressed up with nowhere to go, but when we, what about when you just have nowhere to go? You know, what about when you're just sleeping, 
under un, in bushes and you're sleeping uh, trying to hide out in little cuts you know because you have nowhere safe to safe to to go and then when you're that bone chilling cold at nighttime um when you just think you'll never be warm again uh i i the lights were on but nobody was home there was nobody inside this i was i was a shell walking around for a long time i was just chasing that bottle like all like i, I would black out five times a day mm. uh when i was homeless you know because i didn't want to be awake i just didn't want to feel so if i was awake i was drinking straight vodka just to black out just so i could be asleep and not feel anything if i was awake i didn't want to be awake so it was just hopelessness and so i had nothing else to do i was at my bottom like i, w I hit my bottom and i was just going parallel <laughs> i was just going like this there was and, nowhere, um, nowhere lower to go <laughs> yeah I, don't, I, I mean death they, death they say there's a thing. place lower than hell but i don't know you must have you must have just bottomed yeah. out there you know, you know i, I want to point out too that there are there is collateral damage of like so your mother and i'm not trying to blame your mother in any way shape or form but she obviously had some childhood trauma, so she would bring in men uh, without with, with very little standards for herself. So I, where I'm getting at is, ladies, single ladies, be careful who comes in your child's life. Have standards. They're called people call them boundaries. I call them standards, minimums. Here, you must be this tall to ride this ride. Because look what happened to Jim here. This is not, you know, I, I don't want to get into it because it's it's. It will it will crush my whole my whole soul and I'll I'll start crying. But that should never freaking happen. And it could have happened. Or it could have been avoided if we just said, "Hey, here's who's allowed to have access to to the house." So love yourself is basically what I'm trying to say, ladies, ladies, single ladies, all ladies. Just love yourself. I want to ask you a question about that. You said something that I wrote it down right away. Who were the unex people that you got unexpected help from because you that get me thinking i'm like i keep saying i did this alone but there's no way i did it alone and i started i'm trying to think of where i think the unexpected help came from people like you because i'm still uh in the thralls uh, i meet some amazing people from this podcast and through our masterminds and stuff but who are those unexpected people that helped you first of all my probation officer <laughs> my probation officer i remember i went to lax courthouse one day and um this always blows my mind. I try to think back at it. I'm like, how did I remember I had an appointment with my probation officer? I was homeless. I was drunk 24 seven, like, but I remembered and I went in to meet with my probation officer and she was just like, dude, you are a mess. She's like, what is wrong with you? Like you stink, you smell, you look like ass. And for the first time in my life, I just told her for the first time in my life, I told another human being, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, I need help. It was the first time I walked in. My probation officer was a short little lady. And I didn't walk in there expecting to say this. I walked in there expecting to pretend like I, I still had everything figured out, even though I was homeless and I was drunk 24 seven. And uh, I asked her for help and she turned me into a, she turned me on to a place called Homeless Healthcare of LA here in Los Angeles. And so she made me an appointment the next day. I went down there, I showed up and uh, simply by showing up, uh, there's a lot of power in, in showing up. Um, simply by showing up, they got me into a, uh, you know, I didn't have money and I didn't have insurance. And I thought those were the only two ways to get into, into rehab or treatment. You know, I, I, I didn't know there was what they call programs, like government funded programs. And so I didn't know those existed. So I showed up at Homeless Healthcare of LA one day on Beverly in, uh, in Los Angeles. And, and they said, hey, I'm gonna get you in a place called uh, Phoenix House, which is a, uh, a treatment center. And I said, whoa, okay, well, I don't have insurance and I don't have money. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. You know. And, uh, and so that was the first one, the first two unexpected places. And I got in there and, and, and in the six months, seven months I was in this treatment center, I had counselors that genuinely cared about me. And, uh, when I didn't care about myself. So, uh, you know, when I walked in those doors, I surrendered and I just said, for the first time in my life, I said, Hey, I'm going to do whatever you guys tell me to do. Like whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. So first it was my probation officer, then it was homeless healthcare of LA, then it was Phoenix house and, uh, places that I didn't know existed that, uh, that saved my life, changed the trajectory of the whole rest of my life. Kudos to that probation officer. I got caught up in the system selling drugs in college, and my probation officer did not want me to succeed. And they went out of their way to to make me not succeed. And and but you know I'm so stubborn, so hard headed. I literally have to fight tooth and nail for for. That's what the universe does to me. Makes it gives me makes it incre incredibly hard. So I get it through my thick head that don't do that. So kudos to that woman um, 
that's real rehabilitation and real real help. So that, that's that's a great freaking story, brother. I'm I, I that's why I had to have you on. What were you put on this earth to do? And I'm still figuring that out, Kelly. You know, I'm 46 years old. I'm still figuring that out. You know, um, today I, I, I today I really believe it's to, it's to help others. You know, uh, what I found in recovery is recovery is a lot of reaching up and then reaching down. You know, I, I, I look up to people that have what I want, and that's what I was what I was taught when I first got into addiction recovery. Find somebody that find the people that have what you want, and then hang around with those people. And but never forget where you came from, and never forget to reach down and help the ones that are that, that need your help, just like you got help from from there. So, you know, um, I'm still I'm still I'm still figuring out what my pan my 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 path and my and what God had planned for me. Um, trying to really be open and 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 not force my will on things. You know, I do have I work full time in healthcare, and I really enjoy what I do. I also have a nonprofit. Um, and a fitness clothing line, both addiction recovery based, both uh, using physical fitness as a powerful tool in addiction recovery. Uh, my nonprofit's really about unity and connection and, and uh, uh, you know, establishing uh, a new way of life for people through uh, physical fitness and through unity and connection with others. And, and, uh, and we help a lot of people. You know, I've, uh, I've been in, because of my businesses, um, my fitness clothing line, I've always said we donate one item of clothing for each item sold. And, and to date, um, today I've been in skid rows all over the U.S. from Brooklyn to Phoenix multiple times to Denver multiple times to L.A. 25, 30 times. And we've handed out about 1,500 meals and probably about 13,000 items of clothing to, uh, to uh, the homeless uh, I work in treatment centers often. I go and I and I, I spend a lot of time in treatment centers, addiction treatment centers, and and ones that you know bring in people that are coming off the streets or or uh, out of prison. You know, um, uh, that have very few resources to them. Not like the passages in Malibu. I love those treatment centers, but places that where that where the people don't really have good resources. So, I think I think right now what I'm what I'm trying to do is do is be open to what God's trying to show me. And just help as many people as possible, and uh, and and uh, still figure things out. You're truly remarkable. You went from homeless to helping to handing out food and clothes to the homeless. So that's, I just not lost on anybody, and I love that. And I will tell you, you left off one part. You said you're reaching up and you're reaching down to help people, all the while getting your teeth kicked in. <laughs> it's not easy, man. Uh, yeah, I don't, I've. I don't have the uh, desire to have any drinks or, any, or numb anymore, but I, you know, as you start peeling back the onion in the layers, you start realizing what your childhood trauma is, and some of it's really, really hard to heal. Um, it's it's been ingrained in us for survival. So, I, I just want to make sure people understand. We may make it look easy, but it is not easy. I'm in a constant state of battling. I may not have had the desire to drink anymore or do any drugs at all. I don't. That's healed. It's it's the feeling unloved or less than or, or that that I'm battling every day, which is is it's tremendous. And I'm I demand I say that because I'm 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 feel I think that you feel in the same way. It's generational curses. You know, I read your book and I read your uh, your story, and I remember you in one part of your book. You said you're you're determined to break that that generational curse with your daughter, and I think that's a very powerful thing. You know, to be aware of of what generational curses can be and and uh, recognize them. And character defects are always going to be there. Just because we're working on them doesn't mean they're not going to act up. It's because I know you know my character defects, and I'm constantly working on them. Man, it's like emotional relapse. Like I know things I shouldn't do. That doesn't mean I don't always do them. You know, <laughs> just similar to you, my my obsession for alcohol and drugs has been lifted. But my obsession to be a dumbass has not been lifted all the time. My obsession to to uh, to do things I shouldn't do has not been lifted all the time. So. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a constant battle of being awareness and staying in your conscious and, and my moral compass, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't have that. I, I literally, the moment that I feel a trigger, I just, I just sit in it and I, I, I don't do anything. I don't, I don't, I don't make any toxic decisions, any, um, because I know the consequences, repercussions I've done them all. I, I think I used them all up. So that's funny that you brought that up because I literally was going to ask what does your daily routine look like? Because when you're in, uh, in recovery, we got to keep busy and we got to do things uh, routine and consistently and disciplined because of the 
the character defects and the ability to slip really quick because that, that negative momentum happens fast. You blink your eye, you're like, oops, how did I end up here? Yeah. So what's your daily you know, routine? What I, what I do now is not what I did years ago. You know, I, I think we always evolve. And so my daily routine now is much different than my daily routine was at six months of the year, two years. Now I'm a little over four years in recovery. And, uh, you know, we evolve and, 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 uh, and we're ever, ever changing. So my daily routine today is, you know, I wake up by about 536. Uh, I pray and meditate every morning. I'm still, I'm still figuring this meditation thing out. You know, I, I think the first couple of times I meditated, I'm like, am I doing this right? Like, you know, I wasn't really sure. So, but meditation is, uh, you know, it, it's a very personal thing to each individual and it's going to look different for everybody. And so I'm figuring out what it like, looks like to me, but I, I do it every morning. I definitely pray. I hit my knees. My higher power has got me through, uh, through a lot. And so I go to the gym every morning. I head into, uh, head into my office, um, put in a good day at the office. Then uh, afterwards, I usually go to a meeting. I go to, I go to AA meetings at least five times a week. So I, oftentimes I go to AA meetings. I, I work in a couple of treatment centers where I go and I lead panels. I go into prisons and stuff and I, I bring speakers. And so my weekdays, man, it, I leave at 6 a.m. I'm very rarely home by 9. Do I recommend that? No, I don't recommend that, especially if you're in early recovery. I don't recommend that. But that's what my life is like right now. Then I have to consciously uh, slow it down a little bit. You know, my weekends, I, I tend to, uh, you know, I'm blessed now to have a little bit of money in my pocket where I can, you know, do a little bit of traveling. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, I had never traveled. You know, all my money in my 20s and 30s went to alcohol. And I never really got I never really traveled, you know, I, 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 I came from no money. I never, I would, I would lie, I would lie and say I had money. I never did. You know, I had barely enough to get by. I think I've lived week to week pretty much my entire life um, until now, until recently. So I can get out and, and, and do, do things now. So on my weekends, my weekends are still, I, I have events for my nonprofit on a lot of the days, but uh, I do lots of weekend getaways. So um, where, have you, where have you been recently? It's been fun. I do a lot of San Diego trips. So I live in Los Angeles. San Diego is really, really close. I lived in San Diego for years. Um, I think I went to New York for the first time uh, last year. Uh, been to uh, Seattle recently. Um, I hadn't been to Seattle since I was a young kid. Um, I've been to Phoenix and I've been to Denver. I've traveled more in the, since COVID, I think, than I have in my entire life. And so, you know, I just got my passport uh, a couple months ago. I'd never had a passport as an adult. Get I wasn't out of able town. to have where are you going to go first? Mexico? <laughs> right, right across the street. No, I wasn't allowed to have a passport. The government wouldn't let me have it. They, they didn't want me to leave the United States. So, um, Been there, done that, bro. Honor. What's that? Been there, done that. Can't leave because yeah. of the felonies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I feel, I, feel, I feel almost like a human being now, almost like a grown-ass adult at 46 years old. I got my passport in the mail a couple months ago, and I was like, whoa. Have you got any no. plan to go out of the out of the country? I don't have any. I don't have any specific plans. I I do want to go to the Philippines and I do want to go to Sydney, Australia. So, um, just those are, those are jump away. Be, yeah, yeah. You might, you might want to just try so. like Jamaica or something, <laughs> something close. <laughs> Anyways, I I do do something for me and book something. I I that's traveling uh, experiences over over things are very important and when you go see how other countries live it is humbling where you know i've been all over the all over the world and you go into a true third world country and you go into their inner villages and you see how happy people are you go to one of these blue zones where they're the happiest people on the planet um, because they have no stress. They're not worried about external things. So, you know, one of the, we've always learned everything's internal. Happiness is an inside out job, not an outside in. So I, next time I talk, I want you to send me a text of where you, where you book. Maybe I'll join you, but I'm going to be out in hey. San Diego soon. And I will let you know when I have some friends that rented a condo out there. And, uh, I think I'm going to, I haven't been in California in a minute, so it's, I'll be, I'll be reaching out to you. We're going to switch. Yeah, I love it. I, 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 I'll, we'll come train together. 46 and I'm 47. I'll come put you through a workout. <laughs> um, I want to go to that, uh, that, that gym that you uh, lived at for a year. Old gym, the Mecca, yeah. We're going to switch gears a little bit. My, my reason for branding harder than life is to create awareness for what you call harm reduction. 
Since I aim to be softer and accepting, I like this term. What do you mean specifically by that? Harm reduction is something that, um, man, I think uh, harm reduction has multiple uh, definitions to me. Uh, harm reduction, because of what I do in, in companies and in, in organizations and other nonprofits I work with, uh, has a couple of different terms. Like I work with Homeless Healthcare of LA and they have a couple of different things. Uh, they have Neil Exchange and, and, and the Skid Row. And they have um, they have a place that uh, where people can go use uh, uh, in a safe environment, and so it's in Skid Row. You have to understand Skid Row. Is, if you've never been there, and I, and I hope to God nobody that's listening to this has or has, has loved that lived that life, it's going to happen regardless. People are going to do drugs regardless. And um, so, homeless healthcare of LA, and, and I back this, and I work with it. I don't necessarily, you know, I'm a, I'm an AA guy. I'm a, I'm a I'm a abstinence person. But I understand that's not for everybody, and uh, and and um, so they have facilities and places where people can go use. And if they OD, then you know, staffs there to help them and bring them back to life. Right now, you know, lots of people uh, hit me up on my DMs and 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 talk to me and and talk bad about harm reduction and, and very judgmental and and uh, and that's that's for them to to deal with. You know, I've. Uh, OD a couple times and I'm still here. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a walking testament that, you know, people can change. It's not, you are too. You're a walking testament that people can change. So, so, uh, I don't, I don't promote harm reduction as far as like use that to as a way of life. But I realize that for some people that's very real. And, uh, you know, so, you know, what's so funny is, is, uh, it's not funny. It's just, w w a group of people came and, and kind of got at me in my DMs uh, about some work I did, and 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 you know, and they're like, "Oh, harm reduction! You guys are just letting people use needles, and you guys are just letting you're promoting people to use crack and stuff like that." And I'm like, "No, that's not what it is at all." But but they don't want to listen to it, and and that's their own prerogative. And I and it got me looking when I'm looking at I was looking at the people, and that were attacking me in DMs, and I'm I'm, I'm pulling up their their IG and I'm looking at their stuff because they're attacking me through Instagram, and. Uh, and I'm looking at their life and I'm like, look at these, look at these people. They don't even realize they're implementing harm reduction in their own life. They're vegan, they're gluten-free, they're this, they're that, but they're going out and being weekend warriors with alcohol and cocaine. It's like, you're doing all these healthy things Monday through Friday with veganism, eating healthy, putting on this, this, this image. And then you're going out and power playing on the weekends you're in essence doing harm reduction also by being vegan and stuff. And then you're just destroying your body with alcohol and drugs. So, you know, they don't realize it's, it's they're doing the same thing. So harm reduction is, 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 is something that uh, it's, it's a, it's an interesting topic. It's a very sensitive topic that people are very passionate about. Um, you know, uh, let me jump I try in there to be for open mind. Let me jump in What's for a second. Cause that week, those weekend warriors, I want to, I want to specifically talk about that because that's how quickly it spirals from a weekend warrior to being homeless for 18 months because it's the same demon, the exact same childhood trauma or trauma or wound, insert whatever the hell you're drinking for or they're doing drugs for, and it just add a little more time and a little more pain and a little more avoidance, and boom. That's why, and, and my thing, harm reduction is a little bit harsh because... It, in that case, we just need to get to the root. We need to get to the root of the problem. Why are you drinking and doing cocaine on the weekends? What are you trying to mask? Let's get right there before you're on skid row doing it. And the harm reduction, I get that. I've always struggled with that. My father was a, was a heroin addict, and he would go to a methadone clinic and get methadones because they said, oh, it's safer. It's, and then he ended up dying anyways. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I get it that it's lesser. But I, sometimes you just prolong in the, the, the inevitable. Um, either way, it's you want to change the fruit, address the root. And that's literally, you stole my next question. But what I wanted to ask you, specifically because this, this just came up, is what was the driving force in your addiction? The one thing. Mine was that I wasn't lovable and I desired to fit in with my friends. What was your root cause? Was it? I know and I'm not just going to, I'm not just going to stop there. What was the root cause? What made you drink specifically? Um, man, I've never had it verbalized like that before, like a root cause that made me drink specifically. It was definitely running away from things. It was definitely insecurities. Uh, it was definitely feeling like I was inadequate. Like I didn't fit in. Um, 
and uh, not knowing how to properly deal with feelings, you know, so I would just numb and run away with them. So, uh, man, that, 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 that's a topic I can probably go into a rabbit hole and go and speak on for a long time. My root cause was feeling inadequate, feeling lesser than, um, uh, being very, very insecure and, uh, just not really feeling like I fit in ever and alcohol and drugs, you know, took that away. And, you know, I can sit here and say it was a childhood trauma. I can sit here and say, you know, man, you know, I'm, if there's an A behind it, alcoholism, sex addicts, sex and love addiction, like I, I, I probably got it, you know, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm an advocate for multiple different programs. And, um, you know, you, 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 you and I both work out and uh, I think we worked out, we worked out, uh, you know, in my early twenties and thirties, I worked out like a monster and, uh, you know, I worked out for multiple different insecure reasons because I didn't like the root cause was I didn't like who this person was inside. I didn't like it. I didn't like that person at all. Nothing about it. I liked. And I thought if I got myself to look a certain way, I, I would like myself. I got myself to look a certain way physically. I would get the woman. And if I got the woman, I would like myself. If I got to look, if I got to look a certain way and get a certain way, God forbid ever any man ever try to put his hands on me again, because there was going to be a hell to be paid by a, by a, by a man that tried to do that. You know, there's so many different things that I was trying to fix externally, like you said earlier, but this inside job, the root cause is I didn't like this person inside. That was the root cause. And until, you know, I, I did that ugly cry with a therapist and I talked to somebody for the first time in my life about that shit that happened to me as a kid, about those men that what they did to me. Um, and I was open and honest about it and I could really dig into the, into the feeling and then, and then realize like, why am I a sex addict? Oh, I'm a sex addict because, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I hurt inside. So if I have sex, I feel good inside. I'm, I'm a sex addict because, because, you know, my subconscious mind and my conscious mind, my first sexual experience was with the male. Am I gay? I'm not gay, but my first sexual experience was a male. So I was really confused. I didn't like this person inside. I didn't know what was going on. Um, your subconscious mind is so powerful. and it just the root cause was I hated this person inside, and until I liked this person inside, and I was okay to sit alone with this person inside, you know, it was just a whirlwind. Thank you for sharing. That's exact because there's so many people that are going to listen to this and hear the same thing. And it's, it's it, you just described how I felt, and I wanted to fit in, and I got my my fitting in. It's amazing. How if you want to fit in somewhere, boy, just grab a bottle and yeah, go to any local bar. There's a there's a bunch of people. It's the road less traveled, and that's where I want to be right now, man. If everybody's doing it, I don't want it. Give me the hard way. But everything you just said, I feel, man, I had a hard cry this week, this week with in therapy uh, about a physical abuse that my mom uh, gave me, man. And I I just and I'm the same way, man. That's why I'm a big dude. I, I ain't nobody putting their hands on me again. They do. They're they're walking away with a limp. If they walk away, so I, I think I love you and I appreciate you sharing that. That's took a hell of a lot of courage, which is going to lead me to the next question, which is, um, how's the dating pool is, for a sober, handsome man in LA? There's a rabbit hole right there in itself. That's a, that's, that's a dude. Dude, I, hey, listen to me. I we're separated at birth, man. I I. We could sit here and tell stories. If I had three hours, we could go on. But I, I, everything, every single thing you're going through, I'm going through. You are not alone. You send me a text anytime, and I'll tell you, I, I'm in the arena battling, bro. I, it's it's amazing how when you take out drugs and alcohol, and even if you say, okay, a date, uh, a woman, a prospective mate can have one or two drinks. The second they see how we live, they just it just amplifies their insecurities, and nobody wants to deal with their their issues. And here's a living proof of a man crushing life who was homeless. I am having some success at what I'm doing by just sitting in my shit, man. It, it it's hard. I'm not gonna lie, but it's a hell of a lot better than waking up with a hangover or wondering where the hell my car is or where all my money is or, in your case. Where are you going to eat and sleep? And that's what happens. So, again, how's your dating experience? I can't even say it with a straight face. It's a, man, it's a very humbling experience. You know, it's, uh, you know, I've gone on and off the dating apps, and I've realized the dating apps are very, they're, they're, do they work? I've never been on. <laughs> I mean, they do. 
when it comes down to dating, if I just want to be honest with myself. No, no, no. Lie. Let's start lying now because we are our whole life. I'm really good at that. You know, obviously, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I probably wasn't ready still. I still have a lot of work to do, you know. Um, we're always working on ourselves. And, and when I start to, you know, emotional relapse is a real thing. When I start to start focusing on other people's, like what I think is wrong with somebody else, or I start harboring resentments in any way, then I realize I need to realize like sometimes I need to step back and, and do some inner work. And I can sit here and I can talk about dating in LA. I can, I can say women are pretentious. I can, you know, I can say all this, but it's not, it, it's obviously I'm not ready because I know going into, and, and LA, it's a, it's a different beast, man. You know, LA people, people, and I have to respect a lot of it. People move and reroute themselves from other parts of the country and move to LA. Very few people in LA are from LA and they come here chasing a dream. And so when you do that, if you come here and you leave where you're going to come to LA and chase your dream, whether it's a musician, an actress, whatever it is, like you're going to use people to get to what you want to do. If you have that kind of tenacity to go and reroute yourself. So it's a different dating pool and I can't focus on the shortcomings of others. I have to realize that, that it's in God's time. And, uh, and when I start focusing on what's, what I think, what I think is wrong with somebody else, then there's probably something within myself. So well, see, also for me, too, dating apps were, were a rabbit hole that I got into that, you know, weren't healthy for me. Mm-hmm. I've met some amazing women on dating apps, but, uh, you know, I've, for the last six weeks since I've been off dating apps, I've probably had more serenity and inner peace you know, they take a lot of damn time. Dating takes a lot of time. You know, you got to take a lot of time and you can waste a lot of energy. And, you know, I'm still sensitive inside. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big dude, but I'm a cancer. I'm, I'm sensitive. I feel, and I allow myself to feel now. And there's still, I'm still figuring it out. You know, man went through so his horoscope still, side. <laughs> man. So, so, so for me, you know, about six you, weeks ago. I, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to say, if you want it, and you'll see this as you get further, you think you're healed. Wait till you get in a relationship. That, a relation, a romantic relationship, exposes things that you d- you thought you had addressed, and boy, oh boy, oh boy, and then and then I start looking, going, what am I? What have I not healed in myself that I attracted this? Because you know your vibe, you're an energy. We're all energy, so we're attracting this. You're attracting equal and opposite. So I was looking, oh, I got I got some work to do still. <laughs> it's, it's, it's you know what I did? Like, like you know, you know, I was. A, a, I've really had to be comfortable with my own skin and just kind of like not give a fuck about what people think. Can I cuts on here? And so I, I've, gone, I've gone through some crazy rabbit holes. I've, I've done stuff in the last like year and a half. Like I, I had my first relationship in, in sobriety and it didn't work out. And man, I wanted to act out right away and I wanted to just expose this person, but I didn't. I've changed and it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy, but I didn't act out. But in the healing process, I said, F it, I'm going to do this. I went, I went and explored the kink and fetish lifestyle. I did that. I went and did some some different lifestyle shit that I've never done, man. I did, man. I went to some sex parties. I did some shit. Like, I'm not going to get into details. Hey, but I was hey, just and like, I, I'm healed, but invite me to that shit. I love it. I'm just kidding. I'm just man, kidding. I you know, know, I was just know. like, you know, people, stuff that people do, people judge people for it, but there's like, you know, ooh, I've always wondered. And so I just said, you know, I'm single. I'm just going to do all that shit I, I always wondered about and I wanted to do. So I just did it. I realized it wasn't for me. I went to I went to the parties. I I, I played with the couples. I, I did all this shit that we don't need to really get on. You ain't going to find love there, brother. You ain't going to find love there, though. I'm going to tell you that. No, but you know what? I got it out of my system. And God forgive me for doing that. Um, I got it out of my system. <laughs> so... You know, this is all part of the process of getting me ready for when I do find that woman. You know, I'm now ready. And it's like, if anybody's going to judge me for that, go, go, you know, yourself. Because yeah. we, we've all thought about it. And, you know, I just did it. I, so I went and I I did act out in certain ways. You know, I, you know. At least you didn't drink or drug, brother. I people for sex. At least you didn't What's drink that? or drug. At least you didn't drink or drug. I, I honestly, I mean, I, I think, I think anything, I always say anything can be fixed but dead. I think anything can be fixed, you know, as long as you're not drinking or drugging. I mean, the, the rest of the stuff, it's, it's, it's important, but it's secondary. I mean, th- there are other toxins that people do, you know, porn and sex. That's, and, that's, that's, you know, that really shows you not drinking in LA and trying to date and not being, not, that really shows you like test drinking your, your will and your, and your character because, you know, so much in LA, you know, this year, businessman, business is so much business is around alcohol and drugs. So much dating is around alcohol and drugs. And, you know, well, I've, I've encountered lots of women that don't want to date me just because I don't drink. 
And at first I'm just, you know, you're pride and your ego and you're not ready for it. And, you're, uh, and then it's just acceptance, you know. Remember what I you said know, about the ladies. Type, but as a male and our ego, sometimes that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. And, you know, I want to act out. Oh, you know what? Well, you just go ahead and why don't you just go waste and drink all way all your weekends and go. All... Mm. <laughs> and it's, it's having to be okay with yourself. And uh, yeah, it's, it's standard. It's again, I talked about those standards and, and you're raising your standards. You're not an alcoholic. I mean, well, you're not, you're not drunk anymore. So you can't, you can't, you are, you got to get rid of those feelings and thoughts of the inside it's it's a it's a process man and i believe me i did it I, I dated somebody showed up to my house with a bottle of wine first day and drank said bottle of wine and and then drove home and i right then and there should have been a red flag uh this isn't for me oh no but she was too hot <laughs> smoking and then you know six months later i'm like wow here i am in the same type of relationship that i've always been in uh got some more work to do mr siegel and inward i did i went and i won't do that again and i'll pay attention a red flag is a red flag pay the freak attention and then if you keep attracting it guess what one finger point away three pointing back at you so i love yep. how you went with the, uh, you know there's it's not la it's me so that's crazy self-awareness and it means that you're healing and i'm proud of you because most people don't what's your greatest fear yeah. my brother that's a that's a that's a phenomenal question <clears throat> you know yeah, I love that topic because it's it's fear not not uh, not physical harm, but you know fear of uh, being rejected, fear of failure, fear of um, uh, of death. What is your greatest fear? So that's something that uh, my greatest fuck man. Um, uh, you knew it was gonna be deep. So, this is harder than life, baby. Come on. You know my greatest fear is that my my children live to go through what I went through, and um. And my daughter's on her way right now. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really breaking my heart. It's something that I, I struggle with. And as I'm speaking right now, I'm kind of welling up a little bit because oh, um, see, I have twins. They're 15, boy and a girl. Did you just see me get all tight? Oh, I will What's die. That? I just got all tense up. Did you see me just? I yeah. Would, I would die yeah, my, if um, my daughter has to face what, I, what, what we had to face. You know, my, my, my greatest fear is I don't think it's anything for me now because I've experienced so much and I'm here and like, I'm not afraid of death. You know, I'm not afraid of embarrassment and failure. I failed um, and it's going to happen. You know, so many people, when you have people like you and I, Kelly, I love, I love dealing with entrepreneurs and, 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 you know, you don't know what you don't know. And I love dealing with people that put themselves out there. And if we fail at life, like whatever, so many people criticize people for, for business failures or whatever, but people that criticize are people that aren't doing shit them fucking selves. They're just sitting back and not taking a risk. And, and entrepreneurs that, 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 that talk to other entrepreneurs, like it's not a failure, it's a learning experience. So, you know, you respect the, the fact that somebody puts themselves out there, whether they succeeded or not. And so that's, that's nothing that I, I, I fear. I, I fear, you know, my children going through uh, the life that I went through and my daughter's going through some stuff right now and uh, she's acting out and she's, um, she's, she's uh, experimenting with a lot of things. And she's, she's been through some really tough times that I went through as a child. And I never wanted that for, um, um, I never realized that it would affect me like it is until it happens. And um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of living my, my greatest fear right now something that really terrified me i'm kind of experiencing it in the moment right now and trying to figure it out and trying to deal with it and i'm realizing god put me through what he put me through so i could be here for them to to try to help them navigate and figure it out you know we're, i'm still Meg. figuring life out myself teenagers are, are just figuring out one day at a time you know they think they act like they've got it all figured out but they don't they're terrified inside they're scared inside and so i i'm just here to try to try to be an example and and May I give you a perspective? May I give you a perspective? So, so one of the things I'm picking up from you, because I had the same thing, was the, the lack of control that we had in our life as children. And what, what this is hap why this could be happening is, could, is, is because you're still, you're, it's still unhealed in you because you have no, very little control over that, the, those twins. And that scares the heck out of you. It's a childhood trauma. It's more trauma that you still need to heal and surrender that you might want to go down that path. I mean, again, I only play a therapist. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just saying that that's, that just hit me because I do that with my daughter too. And it's just an unresolved thing that I got to let go, not be a hover parent, understand that they got to learn their way. You learned your way. I learned my way. 
our ways are different, and yet we ended up here. I, I'm going to tell you that they're going to end up okay because they got a father that gets it. But just just think about that. Did that did that resonate at all with you? Like that lack of control that we had as children, uh, and and lack of any cho- any any voice. That's the scare. That right there is one of my still major childhood wounds. It's just if if things are chaos and out of control, I like things in control. I like to control things. But I learned that as as I. The more I learn, the less I know. The more control I think I have, the less control I really have. And just letting it be and knowing that the universe has is, is got my back, truly got my back because every single thing I've made it through, every hardship, every positive, every negative, every up and down, I'm here and so are you. So hopefully that, that gives you a little bit. Um, I could be way off, but it, 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 we seem to be very, very similar, so. When you are down, what can you think of that will make you smile? Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, I think I think about my I think about my kids a lot, and I, I definitely think about them. I think about watching them, how much they've changed, and seeing them that the light click to them a lot, and and just being part of them, seeing them smile and really become comfortable. And my son, more so than my daughter. My daughter's, like I said, struggling, but. Um, you know, when I'm down, I have to get out out of myself. And so, you know, if, if you're in the, if you're in the problem and not in the solution, you're going to stay in the problem and that rabbit hole is going to grow. So, mm. um, I don't, you know, when I'm down, I just change my, I, 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 I change my environment. So, but, and get out of self, I just have to get out of self. So, um, I grab so much joy from, from, um, from watching the progress of, of my kids and, and I'm not involved in, in their lives. I'm a lot, I'm a, I'm a, and I see him, I see him a couple, once a week, once every two weeks, you know, something like that. Um, but, um, I grab joy from, from, from them and others. And I grab joy recently. I reconnected with my mom. I call my mom almost every morning on my way to, on my way to, uh, <clears throat> to work. And, uh, my mom lives a very, very simple life, but she's very happy. And, uh, and I know she looks forward to, to me talking to her every morning. So when I drive to work, I call her and that's so. Um, when I'm down, I just try to really get out of self. So, and I go to the gym. That makes uh, me so happy. I I love that you're talking to your mom. I I would, that's the one regret I have, man. I wish I had a, I wish I could talk to my mother. She's just, I didn't reach out to my dad. You know, my dad and I have never had a good relationship and, uh, we never had, and my dad's a really, it's a, it's a really tough point for me, but I'll call, I still call him. I make myself do things that aren't comfortable because I know that's where I, where growth is. Growth doesn't lie within comfort zones. And so true that, you know, my dad's still, my dad still says things that just, man, oof. and, uh, and, uh, but, uh, I reach, I, I reach out to him cause I know I need to, I knew, I know he loves me inside and I know in, in there, he knows that, uh, he doesn't really know how to, to communicate. And, uh, and I know there's, there's good in there, but generational curses are real. And in the Hispanic culture and families, communication has never been a strong point for us. And so talking you know, I know there's Spanish people man. talk. I got there. It's crazy. They have like 40 conversations in one sentence. Good, 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 good. That's a conversation. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Uh, we're up against it. I want, um, I want to finish with, uh, tell the listeners about the Valor Fitness clothing and the Valor Rising two things that you're passionate about. And it's great causes. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, when I was uh, when I was in treatment at that rehab center, I told you about there was a little raggedy ass gym downstairs, uh, and and I used physical fitness for the first time in a in a real powerful tool uh, for myself, not an unharmed, in a an unhealthy tool, and I really got myself to see my self worth and, and my self dignity back, and uh, and that and that along with the big book, finding my higher power again, really changed my life, and so. You know, me just being some fireball, you know, when you're first new to recovery and you're sober, you're in that peak cloud and you're just like shooting rainbows and fucking darts of unicorn love and shit like that. I wanted everybody to be sober and I wanted everybody to use physical fitness as a tool. So I started a fitness clothing line um, dedicated towards, you know, trying to uh, inspire people to use a a physical fitness as a tool in their addiction recovery. So I, I did that in 2018. Still, still there. Uh, definitely not flourishing in any ways. I, you know, I didn't have any experience in any aspect of that. But I started and I haven't quit. And uh, and and uh, I started a nonprofit a couple of years ago, 
um, to use physical fitness also and get people together. We do lots of outdoor events. We do lots of beach workouts. Uh, we do lots of hikes. Um, we're doing Culver City stairs. Uh, and then we always do meetings. Like we go up to, you know, at the end of a, of an hour workout or any kind of activity, we'll do an AA and a meeting or just check in. Oh, We've like done that. lots of sober uh, social events, big sober events, comedy nights, barbecue, stuff like that. Bringing people in the sober community together, showing people that we can have fun sober. We have a great time and just unite and connect. And so um, just trying to be a safe place. You know, my, my goal with this, if, if you think about a boys and girls club, a boys and girls club is, is for at risk youth. It's for inner city youth that, that uh, at risk youth that don't have a safe place to go sometimes. And so they go here and they, they can get a word, you know, a little bit of activity and do their homework, et cetera, et cetera. For the people that I work with in addiction recovery, I work with people that don't have, that have come out, you know, out of prison or off the streets and they're trying to get their lives back together. But, you know, when you go, when you go to prison and you get out and uh, the judge sends you to this little treatment center for a couple months, when you're done with that a couple months, what do you do then? You know, they don't, they don't have any support back home. They don't have anywhere to go. If you're homeless and you go to treatment for three months, where do you go after that? You didn't have a home. Your, your family doesn't love you or they love you. They're just, they put boundaries on you. I want to be that safe place for these people to go get a workout in, spend a couple hours a day, uh, catch an AA meeting. You know, we, we help people with get jobs, build resumes, uh, get housing, whether it's Section 8 housing, whether it's into sober living. So we do a, a lot of that stuff with, with uh, um the the marginalized addiction recovery community that don't have a lot of resources uh, available to them so so uh it's valorfitnessclothing.com and valorrising.org they'll both be in the show notes check them out they're a great cause jim we're up against it i want to tell you that you have not only harder than life's full support and anything you do I, i'm sad i missed the last event if you give me enough head headway or enough lead time i'll come out and Use me and abuse me in any way, shape, or form. You want me to speak? You want me to tell my story? You want me to do to, to do guest posing? I don't know. Whatever you want. You have not only the the uh, harder than life support, but you have my personal support. You need anything? You, I'm a text message away. Uh, I can't tell you how similar we are, and I'm grateful I met you. You and and I love you and keep doing what you're doing and please let me know when the next event is so I can get my hind parts out there ASAP and I'm going to end it with uh, letting everybody know that this, the show is sponsored by National Technology Management the easiest and best IT company to do business with delivering peace of mind with technology every day visit trustntm.com for more info until next week be harder than life thank you for listening please rate and subscribe to Harder Than Life and let's take this to the next level Get connected at the links below.